Yeah. If you're ready. That was a knock, right? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Welcome to the January 7th, 2013 Select Board meeting. This is the first meeting of the new year. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, we have a blessedly light agenda tonight, easing yes. us into the new year, so <laughs> that shouldn't be too long of a meeting. Famous last words. Um, so we'll start with public comment. Is anyone here would like to make public comment? Please come forward. And identify yourself for I folks. Don't know this is, well, Melissa Perot, um, Precinct One. I don't know whether this is the right venue, but um, the nuisance house bylaw, general bylaw, needs some adjustments for the next town meeting, and I wanted to know how to work with you on that. Okay, I, you can be in touch with me outside of a meeting, and we can talk about that. I can email you about it tomorrow. Okay, okay. and the uh, and okay, fine. Good. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. All right, uh, if there's no other public comment, then we will get to some untimed items. We have a continuous or continuing renewal of annual licenses, a couple of licenses that didn't get renewed as of our last meeting. Uh, Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? Oh, I move that the select board approve the renewals for licenses as presented on list entitled, quote, 2013 license renewals, end quote, dated January 7th, 2013, subject to receipt of documentation noted as pending for the calendar year beginning January 1, 2013 through December 31st, 2013. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. And we had an additional change to the revised motion sheet that folks would find on their desks tonight uh, regarding license renewals. Okay. The one in yellow, I assume. Yes, please. I move that the select board approve a correction regarding the hours of operation of New Paradise Incorporated doing business as Paradise of India, located at 87 Main Street, Amherst, relative to the renewal of their common victualler light and wine and malt. I should surely have the word licenses in there. On-premise restaurant, oh there it is, on-premise restaurant liquor license from Monday through Saturdays, 11.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. and Sundays, 12 noon to 10 p.m. to Monday, through Sunday, 11.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m., effective 1-1-2013. One, one, Second. Further discussion, uh, Mr. Hayden. And I'm just Ms. noticing Hayden. that these hours do not require a special permit. They're within the normal range of hours that okay. a regular permit allows. Thank you. And, just, and this was a, a correction pointed out by the holder of the license to have the license that's been renewed be the same days and hours as has been reflected on past licenses for them. So somehow we made an error with their renewal. Well, that's how it was applied for, and this is a correction that they discovered upon receipt of the approved license. Okay, so there's nothing changing with their, right. their license. Okay, very well. Further discussion, Ms. Brewer, please I, talk I into guess, your mic. I guess I'm just going to thank the office for following up on this because the piece of paper we have on our desk doesn't really seem to reflect what the motion says, but that's okay. <laughs> What do you mean by that? Well, this Close. says correct the error with the following hours, 11.30 to 10.30, whereas this has the break in time. And so I don't really understand, but I'm not the, the correction is eliminating the break in time back to one continuous Monday. Or okay, great. From two, making right. sure. Okay, good. Got it. I'm all good. Yep. All right. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Aye, and that's unanimous. Yes. Okay, next up, um, polling location. Um, we need to make this change because this is where warrants and town meeting results get posted <coughs> as well as where people actually vote. And uh, when the actual town meeting warrant gets posted, it says, and the select board has to approve what the places are that it gets posted at. And for many, many years, North Congregational Church in North Amherst has been one of those places that is no longer called North Congregational Church. So we're not changing the polling location or anything at all. We're just reflecting the fact that that church now has a new name because it's been sold to a new congregation. So that's what this is about. Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? 
I move that the select board approve the North Amherst Zion Church located at 1193 North Pleasant Street as the designated polling place for Precinct 1 as required under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 54, Section 24. Second. Further discussion? Ms. Pro, you have a question? Uh, please come forward. because there was a conflict with uh, other activities that were going on at the at the Zion Church and that we were going to shift maybe to the Lutheran Church of the Word? That, that's not our information from the town clerk and we had made a, we had, <laughs> we tried, we, that, we tried right that earlier. By right? accident we did that a couple of That was of a couple years of years ago. ago. No, this was directly after, after uh, as a result of the, this, this last election. Uh, no, this is this is really a, a housekeeping change so that the election warrants reflect the proper name of the property. There's no intention from the town the clerk of the town to change the location. If we did need to change the location, that would be a separate vote entirely. So we would need to post that anyway. But this is uh, this is only to change the address, Ms. Brewer. Um, I have I perhaps confused the issue by suggesting in the past that I would prefer that we actually moved that polling place to Emanuel because I know that we could hold two polling places, in, in my opinion, in Emanuel's uh, large area there. But that way we'd have one and three vote in the same location because parking's better because you don't have the I steep slope. An but that's not something not exactly we've actually had time. happen. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you have any information, like a contact at the Zion Church or know somebody who knows there's a conflict or whatever, if they could pass that along to the town clerk, as far as I know, you know, as far as we know, it's still a fine polling place. It's not just that she was changing the label, it's that she actually checked with them to make sure it was still a fine polling place. So if something's come up since then, it would be good for them to know the town clerk's office. And then we'll change again if we need to. That's right. At right. this yeah. point, <laughs> <laughs> we're changing the name of the church. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on this? All in favor say aye. 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 And that's unanimous. Okay. We'll make sure we follow up on that in the sure. note to follow up with the town clerk. Okay. We have taxi and chauffeur licenses. I move that the select board approve a new taxi chauffeur license for Gary Burnett Jr. on behalf of Ambassador Taxi Cab and Transportation Company for the calendar year 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for Benjamin Mita and Ian du Dowling on behalf of Celebrity Taxi Company for the calendar year 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I move that the select board approve a new taxi slash chauffeur license for John Renault on behalf of Aaron's Transportation. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Okay, what have we got? We have special liquor. Special license. liquor license, thank you. I move that the select board approve a special wine and malt liquor license for the town of Amherst, doing business as Cherry Hill Golf Club on Saturday, February 9th, 2013, from 1 to 7.30 p.m. in the parking lot area of the Cherry Hill Golf Course for Winterfest 2013, Barbara Bilt's manager. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. Sounds like a lot of fun. Indeed, it's oh always a good event. Everyone should have it on their calendars, February 9th. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. How about a couple of appointments? Appointments would be great. I move that the select board approve the appointment of Jim, Jim Oldham as an at-large member of the Community Preservation Act Committee for a three-year term ending June 30th, 2015. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board confirm the town manager's appointment of Diane Amsterdam to the Board of Health for the remainder of the term ending June 30th, 2013. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 I should note that she's a physician and therefore very much needed on the Board of Health and we're glad to have her. Great, thank you. 
Okay, let's see. We have uh, five more minutes to our first timed item. We have some minutes. Did folks get to look through the various minutes we have? I did. And does anyone have any comments on any of them? Um, fill in a couple of holes that we had from some missing meetings. Let's see. I had some minor corrections. Um, for example, on the minutes of October 15th, I think it would be good to have the article numbers to go with um, the titles of what they're about. We didn't have at that point the numbers for them because that was the meeting before we signed the warrant. Okay, so that can go out. I thought um, of that as I was editing the draft. Okay. That was the reason, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Let's see, was there anything else? I thought they were mostly very clean, but um, then I have some really minor but typo type things for the October 22nd one, insertion of the word the, some cases where there was verbiage that didn't make sense, but it, it does not change the meaning. So I would say, let's just, let me hand these to Mr. Musanti and, and that's the only other. Okay, did anybody else have any comments, or edits for the minutes at all? All right, then, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. <coughs> yes. I move that the select board approve the minutes of October 11th, 2012, October 15th, 2012, October 16th, 2012, October 22nd, 2012, and November 3rd, 2012, as amended. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden. Uh, I need to abstain from uh, voting on two of these. You so, can do I that. I don't or know not. how to do that, but uh, it's at your option. So yes, yes, abstain. I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I don't need to, but I wasn't at two of them, so yeah, I wasn't at one of them. But you know what? I'm sure the minutes are good. I, I, I know they're good. I okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 So that was unanimous, right? Without abstention. Okay. Very well. So, can we do anything else? Mr. Hayden, what can you tell us about the uh, Mount Tom Power Plant letter? Anything to report? Not a lot more. Um, I've had a chance to spend some time with it, and, um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to bringing it forward to us for an endorsement. Um, I'm just trying to figure out the um, sort of the legal underpinning for um, taking a uh, a study with lots of assumptions and demanding a, um, um, a, an action on the part of the, the EPA as a result. That's a okay, so you will keep us posted then on yep, that. Absolutely. Right. Very good. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that takes care of all of our untimed items and we're not quite to our timed item yet. Um, so I will mention that uh, on Saturday, just as a reminder to the select board, we have a four towns meeting at the middle school library. Um, we hadn't heard anything about that in a while, so uh, I confirmed it with the folks at the schools today to make sure that that was still on, and it is. Um, we're now entering that period where we have a bunch of things to do on weekends. I'm not sure why that happens. I don't <laughs> know if people realize that this whole select board thing, it's like seven days a week. Um, so uh, so that is uh, this Saturday. So in case that's not on your calendar, it should be. And also next week is a funny week. Rather than having a Monday meeting, we have a Wednesday meeting at 4 o'clock. Um, that is in this room. That's a joint meeting with the Finance Committee when the town manager uh, presents his budget proposal for FY14 to us. So a couple of strange upcoming meetings. Not strange. Strangely scheduled. <laughs> Okay, now it's 645, and our 645 item is upgrades to the downtown Wi-Fi system, which has gotten some great coverage lately. We have IT Director Chris Pacunas here to talk to us about this, and uh, for folks who are following along at home, there's a very detailed, very excellent press release in the Select Board's web packet about this, so welcome. Great. Well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you for having me, and I appreciate a little bit of time tonight uh, at your uh, meeting, and uh, the first thing... Uh, uh, quickly that I'll say is that the network, uh, as you know, went live last week and has already uh, had more clients connecting to it and more use than even we expected. 
Uh, as you know, uh, to give you just, just a quick brief history on the downtown Wi-Fi, it started in 2007. We received a grant uh, through a relationship we had formed with UMass's Information Technology Department uh, that uh, funded us for uh, close to $200,000 worth of money and equipment to deploy a network. And um, we deployed that network, and it was uh, successful in that a lot of people used it, but there was a lot of pieces to the system, and some of you may know, and definitely some people at home and some people that have tried to use the system would know, it had a lot of holes. Uh, in the downtown area, there were uh, many places that didn't work well, and then over the years, uh, it started to age, uh, and uh, we started to have portions of the system um, failing. And so last year, we uh, asked for some money through the Joint Capital Planning Committee to replace that aging system, and we went out and uh, started to look at companies who uh, were developing and uh, offered outdoor Wi-Fi equipment uh, and started testing that stuff and were surprised to find that we that a lot of it wasn't much better than the stuff we were about to replace other than the fact that it was new and wasn't going to fail uh, its reach and its speed uh, and uh, the areas in which it would cover wasn't all that much better and it was really expensive uh, and so we started to experiment a little in-house and were really surprised about some of the things we found and ended up finding that it would be better for us to make some of our own stuff and we did that uh, and John would tell you uh, in many meetings that I met with uh, John on this uh, that I was cr stressed out about it, <laughs> uh, to <laughs> say the least. Uh, I was disappointed that there wasn't a lot out there uh, made by larger companies in outdoor Wi-Fi. And, uh, and then we also started looking at what other communities had done at that time. Um, prior to that, not really caring, but expecting that somebody would have built a big network somewhere and found that they hadn't. Uh, and in Massachusetts, there was no big networks uh, that were outdoor Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, didn't have a lot of people to look to for guidance for larger networks. The city of Boston has uh, their uh, redevelopment authority had put together a somewhat sizable network, uh, but nothing in, in the lengths of a mile. And so uh, we tested and tested and tested and found that the stuff that we had come up with was really working well. And uh, we we're especially excited about the fact that it was uh, like 40% less uh, to buy it. So we. Uh, we did end up putting our own stuff together and we started hanging them out on street lights and myself and uh, Assistant uh, Information Technology Director Sean Hannon uh, as, what is, as well as uh, Fred Hartwell uh, from the Public Works Department. Uh, we all kind of uh, went out, uh, just not only installed them, but we're testing and uh, changing things <coughs> along the way. And today I can tell you that we have a network we should be proud of. Uh, Amherst, <coughs> Amherst is no question a leader uh, in many ways in, in many ways in terms of technology, uh, but in this way, uh, we're, the, we're the top dog in Massachusetts right now. And uh, we, we have a network that's very fast, it covers very well, and is being used now by a lot of people. Uh, we've had over 20,000 different devices connect to the network now, uh, which is a lot. Uh, so that could be measured in people, but not so much if somebody has more than one device, which many people do. But uh, 20,000 different people used the, uh, using the device, and hundreds at any given time using uh, the, uh, the system. Uh, it's faster than most Wi-Fi networks, and especially outdoor Wi-Fi networks. Uh, and it's specifically designed uh, the radios to connect to things like handhelds <coughs> and tablets, which is really the future of people using Wi-Fi. And as many of you know, uh, and definitely many people know in general, that uh, uh, you know the, the cell phone companies are looking to uh, start to monitor more, less minutes and less number of text messages you send, but really in general your data. How much data are you using? And so I know that one thing that was appealing to uh, John throughout this process was that uh, if people come to downtown Amherst, they can leave their data plan at home. Uh, and uh, certainly people that have done studies and experts in economic development will tell you that people will stay longer at places and choose places to go that have Wi-Fi. Uh, so for uh, what we've put together and uh, I think what we've done and what we've been able to accomplish, uh, we, we've gotten a lot of press, but from varying sources. I mean, in the technology realm, uh, we've gotten a lot of people looking to talk to us about what we've done from a technology perspective, including Government Technology Magazine and some other tech magazines. But, of course, um, uh, you know, uh, standard uh, media outlets are looking to uh, us as just an example for communities from the public's perspective. So a lot of uh, residents can now connect that couldn't before, uh, and a lot of uh, businesses are already using the system that never could. And so we're excited about it. 
Uh, naturally, I wanted to be able to give you an update uh, on uh, Channel 17 uh, to give the system another plug, and I was invited to do so by John and you guys, so thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations on really an excellent system. I use it a lot um, at Black Sheep on Monday mornings. I do office hours there, and uh, the difference is incredible. Mm. Uh, it used to be difficult to connect to. It was, you know, the signal wasn't that strong. Now it's just fantastic, and uh, it, it's just been a very noticeable difference. And it's wonderful. The map, the coverage map of of how intensely covered the downtown is. It, it's really it's something to be proud of. I think it's a real gem for Amherst, and uh, so thank you very much. Yeah. Questions or comments for Mr. Pacunas? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I'm curious. It's, it's a little bit different flavor than the, um, the governor's um, push to bring uh, broadband access to Western Massachusetts, but I'm wondering if it, if it somehow fits into that, that bigger plan that we, we read about every once in a while. I think in some ways it will fit into some of the things he's looking to do. Uh, that will definitely help people that want to provide Wi-Fi have a way to get to the Internet very fast, for sure. Uh, the one major downside to Wi-Fi in general is just that the frequencies that you're using for Wi-Fi, and many people don't know this, are like low, bad quality when it comes to signal and frequencies. And, and the result of that, the government lets you use them for anything you want, whether it's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, or there's a lot of stuff to use the signals that Wi-Fi uses. They're free. You don't have to register them. But the result of having the bad uh, quality signals be given out for this reason is that they don't travel far. So meaning... Uh, to cover, co cover a downtown area, you need 35 of these devices where you could do it with one cell phone tower, if you see the difference. So uh, this exact technology may, may end up as a last mile kind of effort yeah. from, the government's perspective, uh, from the governor's perspective, uh, but I think uh, what he's doing now is first getting everybody connected, but you know, like I say, maybe as a, as a last mile resort, uh, last mile uh, component possibly. Yeah. Thank you. Others, Ms. Brewer? I just wanted to echo something you brought up earlier about um, data plans, et cetera, because that is one of the things that obviously everybody struggles with that, that's associated with either getting, if they haven't had one before, if they have one now, and how incredibly expensive that turns out to be. And there are, in fact, uh, at least one company I'm aware of where I said, well, you know, I'm, my wireless downtown isn't entirely, I, I'm not sure I want to be able to count on it but now I feel like I can, mm -hmm. and so and so therefore I can be participate in that plan. And that makes a huge difference in people's lives. So it's not just a, a nice to do, it can actually make, as, as the quote from Clark House, and as you mentioned, there are people who will be able to get on who wouldn't have been able to get on otherwise, who couldn't, wouldn't have found it easy to get to the library, et cetera, so mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Gene. Mr. Wald. Yeah, I just want to congratulate Mr. Bakunas and the town on this achievement. It's really great. But also to say for the benefit of the viewing audience that it was a, you know, it's a triumph of planning and cooperation too. Because remember when Mr. Bakunas came before the Joint Capital Planning Committee, it was very easy for us as ignorant people to say, let's do this and not this, or, you know, do it piecemeal and be penny wise and pound foolish. And both he and Mr. Mizanti made a very strong case economically and above all technologically for replacing the whole system at once. So that's why we, you know, that's why we have this. And then the in-house effort is great, too. That's really a, a model which we should be proud of. So thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Any other questions and comments from Mr. Pagunas? Mr. Musanti? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, echo the uh, uh, public thanks, but really back to Chris as well, uh, leading our IT efforts on this and many other areas, uh, along with Sean Hannon on this uh, installation. It was another example where good enough is not wasn't good enough. And... Um, we went from a pretty good system for a, a relatively small town to what what we think is the largest and fastest uh, outdoor municipal Wi-Fi system in the state. And uh, uh, you mentioned Fred Hartwell from DPW who has done yeoman's work on the installations and tweaking of the inevitable tweaking of the of the system. Uh, and the proof is in the in the use. And it's across many uh, sectors, uh, residential use, visitors, uh, and a growing number of businesses. So it's another reason to, you know, spend time in downtown Amherst and uh, invest and grow your business here as well. So we're, we want to be leaders in this effort, and uh, we have the right people and tools in place. Thank you. Other questions or comments? All right. Well, again, thank you so much for all your work on this, and thank you for coming in to tell us and the community more about it. Absolutely. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Next up, we have 
announcement of FY14 water and sewer rates. So this is something we've been doing the last few years is we announce so that everybody knows what the new water and sewer rates are at our first January meeting because those rates are essentially baked into the town manager's budget that will come out next week. So he already knows about it. He already knows what those rates will be. Um, and so we announce them now so that people can hear them, think about them, and then we vote on them at our last meeting in January, which is the 28th. Um, but just to get this out there so people are aware of it, we have the recommendation or the information about it before us tonight, and we have the memo in our web packet. And uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Musanti to talk about this. Uh, sure, and again, we, the uh, you know stability and adequacy of our water and sewer uh, uh, systems, one of the fundamental services that the town provides. Uh, we have a very well maintained system and very competitive uh, user user rates uh, as a result. And so as, as Ms. O'Keefe said, I'll be coming in with my proposed budget for next year beginning in July. Uh, uh, I'll be bringing that in next week. Uh, part of that budget includes water and sewer. Uh, and so we, we want to give notice for rate adjustments, if any, that would be effective in July of this year. Uh, I'm recommending on the water uh, rate uh, no change. So we'd have no increase in the water rate. Uh, and what I would describe as a modest increase in the sewer rate of 2.9%. Uh, uh, we'd go from, we'd stay at $3.40 per 100 cubic feet on water and go from $3.45 to $3.55 per 100 cubic feet for sewer. Uh, the, the effect on the average customer, the average four person household uh, on the sewer bill would be an annual increase over the entire year of $12, so a dollar a month. Um, and I put into the memo, uh, uh, how that stacks up based on uh, survey data uh, from other communities. Uh, we remain substantially below uh, the state average water and sewer bills, and we're substantially below a number of our neighbors on water and sewer, including Hadley and uh, Northampton. Uh, and this is using what's now a couple of years old uh, survey data, but that's the most recent that we have is from 2010. So even using 2010 figures for comparison to our, our proposed rates, uh, we're still at a very competitive uh, water and sewer rate. Uh, the second half of the memo I explained briefly, uh, there'll be much more detail about the uh, proposed operating and capital budgets uh, next week in my proposal. But uh, remember, no increase in the water rate. We have a water budget that will go up by, by quite a substantial amount, 9.6%. Uh, we've made some adjustments as we do each year in our assumptions about water consumption and one of our uh, key assumptions uh, and everything's on track for this to play out this way. Uh, you know, the Commonwealth Honors College uh, residential uh, community at UMass is scheduled to open in the fall and so that'll be the lion's share of our uh, fiscal year. That in and of itself will generate uh, a substantial amount of water use that basically uh, creates the funding stream for most of that increase. Uh, we also have some uh, modest capital uh, investments, additional work on uh, water system improvements uh, and the Centennial Water Treatment Plant. On the sewer side, uh, budget is going up by about 2.9 percent, as as are the proposed rates. The uh, most significant uh, item this year is the beginning of debt service payments for the sewer extensions that you've approved into the Harkness Road and Wildflower Drive uh, neighborhoods, and some other ongoing uh, capital capital replacement for sewer lines. Thank you. Questions or comments about the proposed water and sewer rates? Ms. Brewer. I just appreciate uh, the town manager's inclusion of the comparison from the study that they regularly do, but it's always nice to have it right here in the report to remind us that, you know, not everything is cheaper in Hadley. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Stein. And probably the rates are higher now because this is from 2010. That's your numbers. 
so they could be higher in Hadley and Northampton. So our low rates are really impressive. So uh, anyone else comments? Okay, so to recap then, the water rate is going to stay the same at $3.40 per 100 cubic feet. The sewer rate will go up 2.9% or 10 cents per 100 cubic feet from $3.45 to $3.55. Um, and that would take effect July 1st. So just so people can kind of chew on that and the select board will plan to vote on that at our January 28th meeting. Very good, thank you. Okay, next up. We have uh, the voting positions on Mass Municipal Association resolutions for the annual meeting. Um, the 25th, I believe it is, of uh, January is the annual Mass Municipal Association meeting. Um, I know that Ms. Brewer, Ms. Stein, and myself are attending. I don't know if Mr. Walden, Mr. Hayden are attending. No, Ms. Musanti will also be there. Uh, Mr. Pooler will Definitely probably be there. Um, and so this is an annual thing that we, we do. And uh, in addition to having seminars and mm -hmm. lots of networking uh, and, and sharing information and experiences with our colleagues from other communities, there is also the Municipal Association's business meeting. Um, and the Mass Municipal Association is the, the major lobbying group for municipalities in uh, Massachusetts. It lobbies for us both at the state level and the federal level. And every year they come up with a number of resolutions for us to consider. Uh, and we have those resolutions for this year in our packet. Uh, they are long. I will summarize them just briefly. But um, before I do that, Mr. Musanti, um, you are on some kind of fiscal policy committee with MMA. Yes. Are you related to these resolutions at all? Uh, one of them. Okay. The, uh, the, the partnership, local federal partnership. Uh, so it's really preserving uh, federal funding for a host of needs that support local uh, communities, local economies, so uh, affordable housing, CDBG, uh, uh, infrastructure money, uh, 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 water and sewer, um, those types of things. Right. So this is um, so again. These are these are in our web packet, so folks can uh, read along at home if they want all of the details. But um, so this first one, as, as Mr. Musanti said, is about basically asking the federal government to not um, to not forget about the municipalities and how their their cuts at the federal level trickle down to us at the local level as far as needing to. Uh, needing to make up the difference in many cases and so to protect those places where municipalities depend on federal funding. Uh, Mr. Musanti mentioned uh, community development block grant. Uh, that it's money for schools, Title I and IDEA money, um, as well as safe drinking water money, et cetera. Um, so presumably since you're part of the fiscal committee, you endorse this yes. recommendation from them? Okay. Do folks have any questions about that particular resolution? Okay, we might as well just do them all first and then we'll do the vote. Um, second one is, the second one is, oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't the first one. Anyway, um, so the next one we'll talk about then is the transportation finance crisis. Um, we had actually been hoping that we might get information about this from the governor today, but none came out. Uh, he's delayed that one week. He'll be uh, presenting an overview of his proposal uh, next Monday, the 14th. So this is uh, to deal with general, general um, transportation issues at the local level, like uh, like paving, you know, our Chapter 90 money, um, as well as larger things like infrastructure, bridges and dams and things like that. Um, a lo lot of that money comes from the federal government, goes to the state government, and then comes to municipalities. Um, and this is obviously a very big question at the federal level. Um, it's something that the state has been spending a great deal of effort on this year. We, we know from our own meetings with the state transportation secretary that some of us have attended, um, and, the, um, and from hearing from uh, Senator Rosenberg and Representative Story that the transportation funding is a very big priority for uh, for the legislature uh, this session. So MMA is looking to have a resolution yeah, on that. I would just add that another key component of that effort is related to public uh, transit, Thank including uh, uh, regional transit authorities such as the PVTA, and that'll be a fundamental part. And this will be, you know, kind of a main event in the legislature this this 
over the next three or four months in particular about what the needs are and what's possible in terms of investing in those uh, transportation needs. Thank you. Questions or comments about that one? Okay. Um, so let's see. Another one is the uh, uh, is sustainability of OPEB. Right. So OPEB is something we talk about a lot uh, around here. We are starting to address our OPEB issues, but uh, this resolution is specifically talking about, um, again, to have the state be considering what a very big burden this is on communities to not impose any unfunded mandates on us that are associated with that, and even to give municipalities some flexibility about um, eligibility requirements, which was something I wasn't really even that aware of. Um, but it's, uh, it's making sure that the, the state is cognizant of what a burden this is on the local cities and towns and to not do anything to increase that burden. Uh, is there anything else you'd want to say about that one? Uh, no, there's a, I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot about this at the MMA conference in Boston. There's a brand new uh, study commission report that has just come out from the uh, OPEB looking at, you know, defining the, the issue and the problems and looking at options to address uh, that long-term uh, long-term need to uh, fund those benefits thank you questions or comments about that one miss brewer and then miss stein one particular thing that they called out in both the resolution and that they discuss in the opeb report um, version of the summary of the report that's in the beak and i haven't actually looked at the report report yet is they talk about and as an example and talking about flexibility is that in they say most communities an employee can work for 10 years for 20 hours a week be 55 years of age and get with you know generally speaking 75 percent town payment 25 percent person payment health insurance which of course we all know here that none of us don't want people to have health insurance. We're just not clear on why individual communities are doing that rather than the state and the federal government. So um, is that a fact in Amherst? Do we fall under that most? Uh, yes, because we're following state law about what makes you eligible for uh, uh, health benefits when you're vested. And so that's addressed in the study commission report and i'm sure that will be part of the uh, discussion about how that affects uh, those who are not yet vested thank you that, that was the issue i was going to raise also because when you think about the fact that someone can work part-time for 10 years and then be covered for health insurance for the rest of their lives you realize what a financial burden that is for the towns Incredible. Yeah, that that was what jumped out at me too when I was yeah. reading and going, Oh, exactly. who knew? <laughs> yeah, Ms. Pruitt. Although I will follow up on that to say it kind of led in sense to something else that has always kind of troubled us at the same group is is the fact that some communities select boards and sometimes library trustees and sometimes just random appointed sure. or elected positions are eligible for insurance. And like that seems like a really good idea in theory, given the weird, wacky system we have in the United States. But at the same time, um, in terms of the taxpayer, you know, really watching carefully, it just feels wrong sometimes. So I appreciate that that flexibility is one of the things that'll be talked about in in that report. And also, there was apparently some disagreement within MMA about you know how to address that particular issue. So lots more to come, obviously, on that. But just as we've made lots of, we want to have the ability to make adjustments like we have been able to with the, the cooperation of our insurance right. advisory commission. Anything else on that one? Okay, then the last one is a, um, urging a local, state, and federal partnership to protect the environment. It talks about um, how, oh, what a leader Massachusetts is in many ways in, um, in environmental issues, green efforts. Um, and I actually can't remember what this one is asking for. 
this one, it's another partnership. It's again about kind of unfunded mandates, respect the work that the, that the cities and towns are doing and not increase the burdens on us. It also talks about um, drinking water stuff specifically and not reducing funding for that in ways that that would send uh, clean drinking water issues um, to the municipalities. Um, am I missing anything key in this? It's basically environmental stuff. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, that's the environmental one. <laughs> uh, questions or comments about that, Mr. Hayden? Well, I have a, a general question. Do we have any sense how our uh, representatives uh, feel about these? Have they had a chance to respond to them at all? And one of the things that that I would like to be able to do is, is support them in their efforts to support us, which they have done so nobly. Well, it's an interesting question because we're um, it, the MMA represents us as municipalities very specifically and that the legislative, our legislative representatives represent us as a community, but not so much as a municipality. I mean, they do both, um, but it is to the legislature that the MMA is asking for this. So um, yeah, it's a good question whether we would, whether we would wanna know ahead of time if they supported this or we, whether we would just wanna make sure that they support it once they- Well, e even if we don't know whether they're supporting it or not, but whether or not they have you know, some issues or some things that they would want us to understand. Yeah. Um, That's a good point. Mr. Misnanti, would you have any feedback about that? Um, I think it's clear from our local representatives, uh, Senator Rosenberg and Representative Story, that in particular on the transportation finance debate, which it re really will be a debate, because there's not a huge disagreement on what the needs are. <laughs> it's, you know, how can they be paid for and how do we avoid even greater costs in the future by by making those investments in the near term and putting people back to work now um, so i think they would find such a resolution on transportation to be helpful in the harder debate which is how do you pay for all this stuff um, i think the same is true on uh, the environmental article it's a uh, uh it's it's kind of uh a current variation on a theme that uh, the communities and Mass Municipal Association have been saying for years that it's great to have, uh, you know, very far-reaching and uh, environmental standards, but there's a cost that there's a cost to comply with those, and that we need help. It's not just about passing the the tough, strict new environmental regulations it's helping ratepayers and communities be, and bus small businesses be able to pay for them so that's the flavor of the resolution uh, the, d the debate will be in the detail about what's possible as the state grapples with their version of many more needs than there are available dollars um, so I, I'm I'm comfortable uh, I'm comfortable that this won't uh, uh, be a uh, adversarial or yeah. counterproductive step. Yeah, so, so maybe that's the question. Is this going to help? I mean, th these are not issues that, that we're somehow being, uh, we're taking a, uh, being mavericks about. I mean, this is real people right. needing to, you know, really run a town. And not only Amherst, but everybody, the other 350 of us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions or comments before we get to the motion? Um, I will note that um, MMA is always looking to increase participation on these policy uh, committees and um, and in every other possible way. Um, it is, you know, they tend to meet in Boston. It's not terribly convenient for us, so we have not participated lately. We do have a rep out here in Western Mass, uh, which is uh, David, what's his name from Chesterfield? Kielsen, thank you. Kielsen. David Kielsen from Chesterfield. Um, so if if we have particular lobbying concerns we would like MMA to address, we can either be directly involved as a community through, uh, through their efforts or we could be communicating that information to uh, Mr. Kielsen and others. So uh, it's something for us to keep in mind. Okay, so now uh, we'll have the motion on these. And the way this works is at the annual meeting, they, um, the chair is authorized to vote. And I actually forgot to look at the motion, which I hope also mentions the discretion mm -hmm. about amendments. Good, yeah. So if I were not attending this, this vote would also uh, include um, authorizing a representative to make that vote on our behalf. So that's what this is all about. Okay, Ms. Stein.
I so move that the select board authorize the chair to vote on behalf of the Amherst Select Board at the January 28th, 2013 MMA annual meeting in favor or in opposite, in favor <laughs> to, <laughs> sorry, they gave us the choice, in favor to the proposed resolution calling for a full local federal partnership to protect the United States economy, preserve essential services for citizens, and ensure the fiscal health of the cities and towns of the Commonwealth as presented. Second. Uh, further discussion, Mr. Musian. Yeah, I just wanted to point out there is a typo on the motion sheet. It, the business meeting itself is happening Saturday, January 26th. So okay. that date for each of these should be January 26th. Thank you. Um, Still second. And so I actually want to amend it. I'd like to amend them all to say, uh, and for the chair to use discretion as needed for any amendments that might be made from the floor, because that always happens. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Except Second. It has a minute, okay. And for, for the chair to use her discretion, I just want to get this since I have to repeat it. Um, it be the chair or the representative. No, in this chair, case, it's this chair. chair. Yeah. Um, to use her discretion for amendments made from the floor. Uh, yeah, as appropriate for amendments, any amendments made from the floor. Or any amendments. So we could do car accident between now and now. I was going to say, if she goes to the restroom. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we use our discretion. <laughs> <laughs> to vote on your she, she's too <laughs> conscientious. She wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, from the floor. Okay, so we have we have the first one. And okay, it's been moved, seconded, amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Next one. I move that the select board authorize the chair to vote on behalf of the Amherst Select Board uh, at the January 26, 2013 MMA annual meeting in favor of the proposed resolution calling for solutions to transportation to the transportation finance crisis uh, crisis as presented and for the chair to use her discretion for any amendments made from the floor second for the discussion all in favor say aye 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 that's unanimous that's i unanimous. move that the select board authorize the chair to vote on behalf of the armor select board at the january 26 2013 mma annual meeting in favor of the proposed resolution on the urgent need to ensure sustainability for other post-employment benefit oped opeb costs as presented and for the chair to use her discretion for any amendments made from the floor. Second. For discussion, Mr. Hayden. I just want to point out the, the rather appropriate use of the word sustainability in this uh, motion. We often see it misused. Or Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. I move that the select board authorize the chair to vote on behalf of the Amherst Select Board at the January 26, 2013 MMA annual meeting in favor of the proposed <coughs> resolution supporting a local state federal partnership to protect the environment as presented and for the chair to use her discretion for any amendments made from the floor. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, thank you very much. Next up, town manager's report. Mr. Musanti. Uh, thank you, and I want to spend the first, just briefly, couple minutes giving you a, really a preview of coming events <laughs> uh, related to downtown parking changes that are under active development. Um, and I'll, I'll run through what's, what's under consideration, uh, and what I would like to do is uh, uh, work with the chair and schedule a, a public hearing uh, as soon as possible, ideally at one of your February meetings, at which, uh, per our parking bylaw, that calls for public notice and uh, of proposed changes before uh, discussion and enactment or amendment. Um, and I want to run through a number of them. Uh, first is related to uh, uh, Gaylord Street, 
uh, small uh, connector street uh, on the edge of the downtown. Um, um, we've had uh, some active discussion with uh, many of the uh, neighbors of that street uh, related to uh, uh, the narrowness of the street, the congested parking, and uh, feeling that at least at times there's there's uh, inability to uh, have adequate parking for those who uh, live live in that neighborhood. Um, I've had staff uh, review the petition, meet with a number of the neighbors. Uh, I've talked with uh, multiple neighbors. Um, the recommendation uh, that has come forward is to uh, preserve parking on one side of the street, which is the uh, south side of Gaylord, that parking is allowed on the south side uh, presently and restricted on the north side. Um, there's no other restrictions on parking on the south side. It's just open parking. Um, the recommendation is to um, change that from unrestricted parking to town center permit parking, where there'd be during with the same uh, rules that are in place for other town center parking areas like uh, portions of Spring Street or McClellan and some of the other neighborhood streets uh, th that is effective during the daylight hours Monday through Friday uh, during the academic year only and then being open parking other times of the year um, so I can tell you that uh, you know, there's quite a bit of support for that uh, but it's certainly not a unanimous view within the neighborhood I wanted you to be aware of that uh, you're really uh, of the concern I've heard, it's uh, uh, the preferences for status quo, which is uh, while the street itself has been improved with the paving and some curbing and some sidewalk improvements, uh, desire to not introduce a permit system. So there's some ongoing discussion happening on that. But I wanted you to be aware of that. Uh, um, that would be part of the agenda. Uh, we're also looking at uh, Spring Street. You know that we changed to metered spaces um, on the block of Spring Street from the Spring Street parking lot to Churchill, uh, where there's parking reserved for the Lord Jeffrey Inn on the inside of the street, and then what used to be town center permit parking on the uh, north side of Spring Street next to the church was converted to metered parking. Uh, we've been studying the utilization of those spaces since the change. It's been substantially less uh, than before. Uh, we've had some discussion with Lord Jeffrey Inn, for example, about re uh, reverting those spaces back to uh, uh, town center permit spaces and preserving the meters for you know, evening and, and weekend hours, uh, Saturday hours. Um, so that's another one that uh, you will likely see uh, <coughs> in the recommendations. Uh, we're also, we've also been looking at Boltwood Garage, and uh, I have a staff recommendation to increase the number of reserved monthly spaces in the lower level by eight. Um, so that would be a change. There's a uh, uh, ever-present waiting list for those spaces. Um, we're looking at that as well as looking at doing another modest adjustment to the uh, annual fee for the reserve spaces. Um, also looking at uh, um, increasing, possibly increasing the number of 15-minute spaces. We have a handful, I think there's four now. Uh, there's been... Uh, in my discussions with uh, representatives of the business community, merchants, uh, business improvement district uh, representatives, uh, some interest in exploring increasing the number of very short-term, high turnover, 15-minute uh, spaces. And so we, we're going to be having a brainstorm session with them uh, later this month where we, we pull out the downtown map and talk about where we might consider those. And so I, I think you can expect to see uh, that as part of an overall proposal. Uh, we're also looking again at loading zone spaces. We have a number of loading zone spaces 
uh, in the downtown, including uh, three spaces on the Main Street side of Town Hall and looking at both the uh, utilization of those spaces, the hours, uh, and how many do we need to meet the needs uh, with both the formal and informal loading zones that occur <laughs> in the downtown. Um, so you can expect to see recommendations on that. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, we're looking at the location and number of taxi stands and you'll see recommendations on how we might improve that, that uh, uh, the number of taxi stands and where they're located and how that fits into the overall plan. So I think you can, you can see all of those kind of coming in as a package uh, for consideration. Um, I'm meeting with the uh, Business Improvement District uh, Transportation Subcommittee, of which I'm a member. Uh, uh, later this month, we're also planning to talk through this with the Town Commercial Relations uh, Committee before we come back to you with a finalized formal staff uh, recommendation. Then you would you post the public hearing and you do your thing. Thank you. Questions or comments about this? Mr. Santi, Ms. Brewer. Just, uh, and, and I'm sure you would have done this anyway, but just to be clear that maps and numbers will be very helpful oh, yeah, in sure. terms of, for example, I know of one taxi stand. It uh, doesn't mean there aren't plenty other ones. It's just that I don't have any conception as to where those are right. at this point. And then in terms of the Boltwood garage also, particularly with the lower level, because we do you know, irregularly get complaints. There's no place to park and those spaces are sitting empty, blah, blah, blah. People want to pay for them. We should be very happy about that. But just to give us a sense of, you know, eight more in addition to X we already have is how many out of how many are actually there. I mean, sure. we all have in okay. our heads an idea of how many are there. Yes. But, um, yeah, we would have uh, visual as well as the, the numbers. That'd be great. And how the reserve spaces are even structured has been another conceptual discussion about is there some type of hybrid that might make sense so that evening usage, for example, could be increased by some parkers. So we're going to be uh, we're going to be taking a longer look at that as well. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments, Mr. Walden and Mr. Heaton. I mean, th I think the idea of a public hearing or forum would be very welcome because I've heard some complaints from residents too. For example, um, to the east of Spring Street, who are concerned that the metering there was pushing parking right. in the neighborhoods, causing problems. So I think they'll be very welcome for right. news to people there. Thank you, Mr. Heaton. Yeah. I'm wondering just how ambitious we might be about having only one hearing. For all of these, there's um, there's sort of three separate um, types of parking issues that are tangled in that, and just I, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to ask that you might consider how to make it so Stephanie can actually get us out of here before 11 o'clock <laughs> that night. Well, conspicuously absent from this uh, consideration list is the notion of adjusting the hourly rates. <laughs> so that will, that will uh, hopefully directly contribute to the length of, or the shortening of the hearing length. Uh, it sounds like a large number here, but it doesn't have to be overly complicated. I think with a more detailed uh, maps and numbers and all that, that it could be fairly straightforward. Yeah, my, my, my concern maybe is that um, sort of the, the two biggest chunks is a commercial, there's a commercial sort of adjustments that have one um, you know, group of people who are involved and one group of issues that are involved. Uh, then there's the residential things. You know, Mr. Wall brings up one concept, and, but there's a whole bunch of others that it's a different group and a different set of issues. Um, I just, just want to be sensitive to that, that's all. Make sure that people have a, you know, a chance. Thank you. And it's also a good point, though, that they get considered together because downtown parking issues are, you know, they're all related. So you turn one dial and it turns all right. of them. So, yeah. um, so um, it, it's really good to have the bids transportation committee being a group that's really looking at this. Now, obviously, that's representing more the business perspective, not the right. residential perspective, but the town um, uh, through Mr. Musanti and then, of course, through our public hearing, we'll also be looking at how all that works with the residential component of it because those permits are both 
both for uh, people who work downtown and for people who live downtown, but really kind of seeing what happens when you squeeze the balloon, where does it end up? Um, it's, it's important to think of those all in the same context. So I, th I think bringing them in as a package will be good, but, uh, but Mr. Hayden makes a good point, so we'll try and be <laughs> mindful of how out of control that might be. Ms. Brewer. Speaking of adding more things to it, so um, making it clear in the report memo, however this was formatted, to say hourly rates not being considered, you know, at this point, and enforcement hours as well, because you know that's something I have a thing about in terms of the machines versus the meters. And so, if we're not discussing that at this point, I, I'll survive somehow. But it would just be nice to be really <laughs> clear that that's not currently on the menu. And then the other thing, I'm not sure where the feedback comes in on this, but I would like some sense that just because we don't necessarily hear about it a lot at this body, that the system that's not so much, well, it's associated with the fact that you have these permits, right? So there are permits for you know employees and businesses, and there are permits for people who live downtown. But then when they have visitors, there are these things. And that right. came up associated with the Gaylord thing. The I'd like passes. to hear that the, the, right. the daily passes thing is right. working out well or isn't or sure. needs to be tweaked in some area or whatever because I think there aren't people who appreciate that, you know, there are people that have to deal with this hassle right. rather than having to, you know, just have a ginormous driveway. So, right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else like to comment on this now in advance of our meeting feature? Okay. Very good. Moving right along. Okay. Uh, next, I uh, want uh, a brief update on uh, Taxi regulations and licensing update. No, we're not amending the taxi regulations. That was that was so last year. Uh, the uh, uh, I had Deborah pull together as the uh, we've we've transitioned now to the new rules and the the, the uh, a snapshot of how we're doing in terms of how many taxi companies are renewing and how many vehicles are on the road with the new uh, uh, the meter uh, the meter. Uh, system with properly inspected vehicles and uh, so you do have a late addition to your packet uh, memo uh, to me from Deborah Roussel and the gist of it is it compares that in 2012 we had 12 taxi companies who had a license for some or all of the year uh, using a total of 61 licensed and inspected vehicles uh, as of today, January 7th in 2013, uh, we have nine companies have uh, received, uh, applied for and been approved for renewal of their business license. And as of now, we have uh, 19 vehicles compared to 61 uh, that are uh, either fully inspected or are in the midst of being uh, uh, inspected by the police and the uh, inspection services department. Uh, there's 14 that have their uh, inspection stickers in hand. Uh, there's another five awaiting the last couple steps uh, to do that. Now, so that gives you a sense. Uh, so I guess not, I mean, that is a, uh, a pretty big difference. Now, this is a snapshot in time. I think it's not unreasonable to expect that we'll have some additional uh, vehicles because the companies um, in, in many cases are licensed to have up to uh, more vehicles than are currently on their active list. Um, but I wanted to give you that snapshot. I'm, I'm sure we'll do this periodically and so you can kind of have a sense of how it's, how this be one way of showing how it's working. Uh, and Ms. Musanti and I were noticing this memo before the meeting and um, Christian Cab, which we had just approved at our either the first or second December meeting is not on here. So he's going to check the status of that. That was a license that came before us right at the end of December that was specifically for a 2013 business license. So I'm assuming that it should also be part of this list for a total of uh, 13 companies. But we're checking on that. Ms. Brewer. Yep. Except this list actually only has 11 companies on it. So worth noting as well um, <laughs> when okay. you're in a hurry <laughs> counting is yeah. complicated um, <laughs> one of the thank you one of the things that makes this this time of year different beyond the fact that it's license renewal time of year is because of these two separate processes where one's the weights and measure expect inspector like the same guy who does the gas stations I presume um, and than the safety inspections, which is so it's adding in a whole new thing we didn't have before, which is what we're really happy about. 
So what I'm wondering is in terms of as a customer, as a customer, if you want to get in a cab and you see there's no meter, then you know for sure, forget it. I don't want to get in this cab. But beyond that, once they get to the point where everybody's got a meter or something that looks like a meter or that we assume is an approved meter, um, what is, because we don't do medallions and we don't make everybody have the exact same kind of labeling. I mean, we have suggestions, but it's not hard and fast. It would be helpful, I think, after we get past this initial point of whether or not there's an actual f a fare meter in there, is what can I look for as a, as a customer? Where's the little sticker that I look for that says this has been inspected within the past year, that this isn't just some junk cab? On the back of the cab, bright yellow sticker. That the so yellow the, sticker. The, the, that's part of the inspection process. The police are putting a bright yellow sticker on saying that right. this is an approved cab. I think it's on the back windshield. Right. Um, we should put a picture of that on the website. Is We've what talked I'm about that. We're going to yeah, pursue we're that something as to kind of a consumer like, awareness yes, thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then we could let UMass and Amherst College and everybody know this is what a real cab is. Yeah, so we've been in conversations really with great. UMass about that so that they can publicize it once yeah. the students come back because, um, you know, exactly. this, this was a lot about health and safety issues and, right. and the lack mm -hmm. of regulation um, really leading to some pretty loose activities out there. So uh, we thought that the requiring the meter was going to be a way to professionalize the whole fleet right. and, uh, and be a very obvious thing um, for the passenger to look for. If it right. doesn't have a meter, then it's not a legal cab in Amherst. Um, so yeah, uh, getting more of the word out about that is is part of the plan. So thank you. Yeah. Right, and we could you know throw that picture down and then get past that along. The other question I have about this, and I didn't pull out my taxi regs that are sitting here. I don't know if we know this off the top of our heads, but if there there are surely people out there that have cabs that aren't ready yet that are that are running, and so what is What's the penalty in terms of, I mean, the police obviously know there's only 19 right now. That's pretty easy to keep track of. But I mean, in terms of them looking out there as they're driving around and saying, I don't see the yellow sticker, or I mean, the, the regs do support them being able to say, hey, you're not registered. You know what, I, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's that there's a proactive thing that's written into the way the regs are written. So it isn't just complaint driven. It's that they can actively notice, just like they can notice if your driver's license has the little sticker or you have the little inspection thing. They can notice, hey, I don't see that yellow sticker. I can pull that cab over, et cetera, and move on from there. Because I can't honestly believe that there aren't cabs running that shouldn't be running right now. There are no students here right now. So right, the, so that <laughs> helps a lot. <laughs> the, the business uh, is down. But, um, but so they have that ability to do that. It, sure, there's a, there's a way to uh, penalize them. Additionally, all of the recommendations that come to us to license a company, a license, uh, a vehicle, or a driver all come with the uh, chief of police's recommendation. And if this company has, if, if company X is screwing around with <laughs> unregistered okay. uh, vehicles, they are so unlikely to get it. any registered vehicles right. or get their, uh, their driver and yes. company licenses <clears throat> recommended to us. So we're hoping, we're hoping we got some mm. safeguards going here. Right. Other questions or comments about the taxi updates? All right, moving along. Great. Uh, FY 2014 budget preparation update. Uh, this will be a five-second update. I'm presenting my recommended budget uh, to you and the Finance Committee a uh, week from Wednesday on the 16th. Uh, and accompanying that budget will be a, hopefully a coherent, <laughs> reasoned transmittal letter and then a couple hundred pages of detail <laughs> on uh, operating in short and long-term uh, uh, performance objectives, et cetera. Uh, accompanying that. The other key thing with the budget, uh, again, it comes back to the Mass Municipal Association Annual Conference in Boston, uh, which is January 25th and 6th. Uh, the governor, Governor Patrick, is now scheduled to speak at the opening session on the Friday morning, which directly impacts the timing of the day that I want to get to Boston. But he'll be there Friday morning. Uh, he is expected to release his budget proposal for the state budget and his recommendations for state aid to cities and towns and school districts on two days prior, Wednesday the 23rd. So I think like past uh, MMA conferences, uh, 
Uh, I think we can anticipate the governor giving us some kind of big picture summary of, of uh, what his recommendations are and quite possibly uh, school district and community specific, at least for the big, uh, big items, chapter 70, uh, unrestricted aid, things like that. So those are a couple big milestones uh, in, over the next few weeks. Questions or comments about FY14, Ms. Reed? Yeah, for, for our budget presentation, will we be able to get some pieces of it beforehand? Uh, that's the plan. Even uh, if it's just the blurbs and maybe not all the numbers? Uh, at minimum, the uh, um, transmittal letter piece with all okay. the summaries and the key, the key initiatives, et cetera. Um, ideally, the whole book, but I, I'm not going to make that our ankle yeah, promise. It's, it's hard to uh, do all the digest and write <laughs> in that one hour, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, other questions or comments about the upcoming budget presentation? All right, sure. next. Next, uh, uh, staff and departmental recognitions uh, wanted to underscore, uh, you know, pointing out we have so many employees who have done uh, great service for the town for many years and um, at our annual uh, uh, employee holiday party that we have every December, uh, we make a point of recognizing employees who have reached uh, particular milestones. And this year we recognized uh, 32 different town employees uh, who are reaching a milestone year, uh, years of service, anywhere between 10 and 35 years of service. And uh, uh, there are a number of them, and uh, including our police chief, Scott Livingstone, 35 years. And then uh, I wanted to also point out Kenny Isabel, Department of Public Works, 35 year employee. Uh, Kenny uh, uh, in December announced that he was retiring effective January 2nd and uh, he was he joined us at the holiday party and it was a very touching moment for his colleagues to give him a really a well-deserved uh, standing ovation uh, he's one of the great kind of workhorses for the town and DPW uh, keeping our our uh, roads safe and our, our crews organized etc there are a number of other folks on here with different milestones. Uh, um, uh, we have a number of police officers here, uh, and they were well represented at this gathering. Uh, uh, you know, we have one of the finest police departments in the state, and it's it's directly a result of uh, the caliber of the people uh, we have working on the force. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention, uh, well, we talked about IT earlier. That was a great, most recent of many examples from our IT staff uh, trying to be leaders in everything we do, including downtown Wi-Fi. We might be the leader, uh, in at least in Massachusetts, if not a greater area, uh, in terms of really being cutting edge and service-oriented. Uh, so I just wanted to... Uh, point that out. Thank you very much. And so again, for folks who are paying attention at home, uh, the employee recognition list is in the select board's packet. Yes. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. There's a list at the bottom of all the folks who work for the town who have more than 30 years of service. This is, I believe it's 14 people on that list. Right. I believe there are something like 270 or so folks. Well, who counting work. the different seasonal and part-timers, there's about that number. There's about 190 permanent full-time uh, employees, but uh, okay. with all the seasonal folks, part-timers, it's, it's up around 270. So for 14 of those folks to have been here more than 30 years is pretty amazing. And when you look at the longevity of so many people, these are just the folks who, who hit the milestones, not counting those 14 that who have been here more than 30 years, but everybody else listed as folks who were, this was marking their milestone year. Um, that really shows what a fine place to work the town of Amherst is. And uh, I think that that's something for the community to be proud of, um, and certainly for the town manager uh, and other staff, that, that 
Amherst is a place that people want to uh, to work and make their careers, and that is evident from the amount of time that they spend here. And uh, we're incredibly fortunate for that. So, thanks uh, thanks to all for their for their long and continued service to the town. And thank you, Mr. Musanti, for bringing this to us today. Questions or comments about the employee recognitions? All right. Great uh, PBTA advisory board update. I'm I am continuing to serve as chair. It's only been uh, a, uh, just under a year now. Uh, 2012 was a very good year, very difficult year, but um, we're on the cusp of really having a uh, needed uh, debate at the state level about transportation infrastructure, but also public transit and how it's funded so that we can preserve and enhance our public transportation and offer it in a way that's affordable uh, to, to people, uh, to get them, keep them out of their cars and get them to work, et cetera, or to class. Um, the, uh, the big event on that is the, uh, uh, there'll be a legislative proposal put forward by the governor and then there'll be a very robust legislative debate. The speaker and the Senate president and the governor are in agreement that this is a priority for this uh, coming uh, legislative session and really over the next three or four months. Um, the uh, PVTA has been actively involved in that conversation about public uh, transportation. Uh, we've met with uh, Mass uh, DOT Secretary Rich Davey. Uh, our PVTA Administrator Mary McGinnis has been actively involved on uh, different study committees on the public transportation piece. And we are aggressively pushing that any uh, funding, new funding or how the funding is allocated out for regional transit needs be very cognizant of the number of uh, passengers being served. And you know we have the second largest transit system in the state, PVTA, serving uh, uh, a large portion of, of uh, Western Mass. Um, um, we have well over a million passengers a year just in the town of Amherst. Um, so we're very uh, hopeful that whatever proposal comes forward uh, it provides adequate and sustainable funding for public transportation, but also recognizes that the different parts of the state are different and we all have needs and public transportation is a very important and, and highly used and could be even higher used uh, mode uh, in our part of the state. So we're actively working on that and that's what we'll, one of the things we'll be following in the weeks ahead. And that really is a, uh, a much better solution uh, as we continue to struggle at PVTA and elsewhere about how do we fund uh, the service that's being provided in an affordable way. And um, I'm hoping that the transportation funding debate and legislation puts us in a position to forestall any, uh, you know, uh, severe adjustments that would be needed otherwise on things like fare increases or service reductions. So it's going to be a uh, very uh, engaging couple of months and one of the most important discussions we'll have um, in trying to put that puzzle together for the long term. For regional transit. Thank you. Questions or comments about PVTA stuff? And I'll note for folks at home um, that uh, Mr. Musanti is the select board's representative to the PVTA advisory board, so not only has he had to take on this burden as chair, <laughs> lucky him, um, but the fact that he's going at all, he is going instead of us. This is a, basically a select board uh, seat, but we delegated it to the town manager basically because he gets paid and we don't, and there's only so much we can do, and going to Springfield every month is just a little bit more than most of us can deal with. Um, so we appreciate very much uh, his representing Amherst's interests there. It, it actually makes a lot of sense to have him there because he is so much more tied into kind of the finances and the infrastructure, et cetera, of the town than, uh, and can be much more well-versed about that in that group than, uh, than any of us could be. Um, one comment, um, I learned recently that the Cape Cod Regional Transit Authority is going to be accepting on their buses the uh, Boston's Charlie card. 
and Charlie ticket system. And I thought, wow, that's fantastic. And uh, so that's neither here nor there. I'm just mentioning it. So that, that's kind of an interesting way. Again, you know, people in the eastern part of the state, they think east. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how that would tie in with anything out here. But the idea that there was a, you know, a, a transportation card within the, uh, within the state was a little bit interesting as, you as know, potential. The PBTA is rolling out the, I think they're calling it the fast break pass, which is the you, you buy a card and you you buy round trips on the card and it's a swipe instead of fumbling for change every time you get on the bus. Um, so I, I, I don't know, I mean, it's a good question for me to follow up on whether it's, you know, it's like the easy pass on the, uh, what was the easy pass on the, on the mass turnpike being accepted. I didn't even realize there was gonna be a card out here. So that would work for like Amherst to Northampton trips? Uh, and it any, any it will during the times of year when there's a fare being charged and they're rolling that out over over the next 12 months. So if you're not a student, if you don't have student ID, there's always a fare between Amherst and Northampton. There's a whole phase that I wouldn't pretend to know the, the mm -hmm. timing of how they're doing it in the different regions, but I know in the, in the Springfield, Holyoke areas where it's a fare-based system that that's in the near term. Interesting, thank you. Other questions or comments, Ms. Brewer? Anything associated with the fair base system as you move forward that can be around, I bought so much money on my card and now I can use my card as many times as I need to use it, as opposed to the way that PBTA used to sell tickets, which I really hope they don't anymore, which is you have to know that you're going tomorrow <laughs> or you, have to, you only have a 30 day period that it's good for. Well, maybe you don't wanna take 13 trips this month, but next month you want to. And so you end up wasting money and blah, 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 right. blah. It's just, it's messy. And so if they could go to something that's more like the Charlie card <coughs> where right. you just put on your money and then you use it up as you need to, um, anything they can do to move in that direction would certainly okay. make people's lives easier. Other questions or comments about PBTA? Okay, next, recent upcoming. We talked about a, a, a couple of important upcoming uh, activities uh, related to budget, but I did want to uh, mention uh, an event that um, a number of us were able to attend on New Year's Day. Uh, one of the uh, just more touching events that I've been to in Amherst in a long time. Uh, New Year's Day at two o'clock, uh, uh, Human Rights Commission and others organized uh, an event ar around the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation by uh, President Lincoln. Uh, there were ringing of bells, church bells. Uh, uh, we had 100 or so people brave uh, bitter cold weather <laughs> gather on the front steps of Town Hall. Uh, Bob Romer uh, read the governor's proclamation that uh, Senator Rosenberg had procured. Uh, and there was a ringing of bells. We had the fire department bell there. Uh, it was just a very moving, moving uh, celebration of that fundamental freedom and kind of a recognition of how much progress there's been. There's still so much more to do, but how far we've come. Thank you, that was a lovely event and, uh, and kudos to the Human Rights Commission and yeah. to Deb Radway, yeah. uh, staff liaison to that for putting together a very nice event. The ringing of the bells was really pretty amazing. Cool. Anything else? All right, uh, let's see, then member reports. Oh, I'm sorry, question, Ms. Brewer. Town managers report for future reference. Um, one of the reasons I don't like reading the paper beacon is because then it makes me ask more questions. <laughs> but <clears throat> you could cancel your subscription. Yeah, I'm thinking that could work. <laughs> so if they won't put it out electronically, they do put it out electronically eventually. But at any rate, um, obviously medical marijuana is a much bigger thing in people's minds in terms of, and we know that the state has to put out regulations. But just in terms of if you could plan to keep us updated on a regular basis as to which things will be Board of Health things, and then which things will be, they're talking, you know, they're talking about some communities having moratoriums, bans, zoning bylaw changes associated with this. I mean, it's, it's like huge in terms of all the different possibilities of things that could happen. And of course, with no regulations in hand, who knows what might happen. But I, I'm thinking that even though Amherst, of course, sure. will be very open-minded into all these things, the pressure from our surrounding communities might cause, force us to kind of act sooner rather than later on some of these things. So you just put that on the list of, Things will have to be updated on. And then completely randomly, sure. also associated with being updated on, 
New state rules permit electronic billboards. I have no idea if Amherst permits electronic, I mean, if, if we would have a place that this would apply, but they talk in here about to allow prospective applicants time to obtain municipal approvals. So just to have a sense, so that we're not surprised at some point, it's like, no, you know, those are forbidden by local bylaw or blah, 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 because apparently the state has changed its mind as to its willingness to have them. And so just so that we have some clue as to if this has any impact on us whatsoever or if it's only along 116 or whatever. Okay. Anything else, question or comments from Mr. Santi? All right, member reports, liaison and representative reports. Anyone? Sure. Ms. Stein. <laughs> I went to the personnel board on December 19th, which was ages ago. Um, we discussed exit interviews and Deb Radway would conduct them um, unless somebody would prefer for a member of the personnel board to do so. Mr. Musanti was there and it was his birthday. <laughs> oh, which was very exciting. Um, but he also was presenting the fact that um, uh, Dave Zomek right. was being promoted to assistant town manager, which everybody was very interested in. And then they set the meeting for the um, oil employees meeting with the personnel board. And I can't tell you the date because it got shifted since we were originally gonna do it on a Thursday and it got shifted. So I don't have that in my notes. Um, I also was at CPAC um, and that is their usual meeting where they review the proposals and um, make a list of further questions to the proposers so that they can have a better sense of um, the projects that are proposed and that information is necessary for their decision making, which as I mentioned, it's going to be hard because there's not enough money for all the good proposals. And that's my report, except that I could talk about the flag. Um, I wrote to um, Mr. Mosier, our um, wonderful artist who the most recent flag that I have in my book is the one that you have a small copy of on your desk and um, asked him about it. It turns out he has some personal issues, so he can do one more tweak, which he was gonna try to do today, actually. Um, and then he really would like to have us take the ball and. Um, do it from there and I've talked to the flag company and they said they can take the flag and put it into the ready format for an extra hundred dollars um, and I think we'll just have to distribute that amongst the people who buy the flags and raise the cost a little bit unless people have another solution. My husband said maybe the Slipwood would like to divide up the hundred dollars mm -hmm. and pay for it. Oh, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but at this point. <laughs> um, anyway, that's the current status and I think things should move along now very quickly because he cannot do any more work on it. So it's not a matter of waiting um, for him. It's, it's a matter of taking the design and going forward and maybe Mr. Wald will know this is the last design I had mm -hmm. um, in my folder with your um, stated color preference etc and I know that in order to send it to the flag company we have to go into this PMS chart and match it as best we can which I think is not a big problem but I know there were tweaks to the interior of the shield and that's what I don't know if that's what he's working on right now. Mm -hmm. I got a message today saying he was going to try to do something today. Yeah, it really sh shouldn't be much of anything. What you have here is the uh, version that I put together based on the conversations of the Historical Commission Design Review Board when they approved the flag. The, the issue was there was some discrepancy between the electronic file that was sent and the printout. And we preferred the version that came in the printout from Town Hall. So what I tried to do was to match the colors here 
and we've just been sending back and forth with Mr. Mosier to make sure that this made sense to him and that all the details were there. So nothing has changed since that time. Okay. What he did was to design the actual wood engravings of the images of the book and the sheaves, and we were thinking that he would then integrate the whole thing into one graphic. But as you say, under the current circumstances, it might be easier just to pass it along to the flag company. Right. So right. we just wanted really to give him, as the artist, uh, the right to sign off on our interpretation of what we'd all agreed to. But it should be ready to go. Right. Because I think this is fine. <laughs> you know, I'd like the um, lettering maybe just a slightly brighter yellow, but the rest of it I think is super. Yeah, I think that's an artifact of the printout. But again, that's the kind of thing we want to check with him because he has a sense for those things. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I just thought you'd be interested in the fact that that's the progress and we will be moving forward. Great. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from Ms. Stein on any of her reports? All right. Anyone else? Liaison reports? Mr. Hayden. Just three very brief ones. Um, the Recycling and Refuse Management Committee are meeting this Thursday to put together their final um, version of the task group. I don't know what to call it yet. Um, for trying to figure out zero waste. Um, the uh, Public Transportation and Bicycle Committee are working on, um, and have been uh, last meeting, we're working on, um, I guess there are three different designs now for the Pine Street repair. And they're working through those to try to figure out which one is the best. And the Public Works Committee are getting together a presentation to us, well, I hope it's a presentation, on their recommendation for sidewalk repairs coming up stay tuned yeah so uh per that um we got a recommendation from e by email from public works committee about recommendations for paving and sidewalks going forward mr hayden helpfully suggested that when we get to kind of that point of talking more about the budget for next year and what paving is going to look like um to have them come in and actually talk to us about their recommendation in particular to uh let the uh the community get a better sense of the um, the rating system, what's it called, OCI? OCI, right. Which is, stands for what? I can't remember. Um, hmm. Something index, the, the... Something condition index. <laughs> yeah. Something, hmm. overall condition which, index. Or yeah, which, like is, which typically yeah. applies to the roadways, but here is being used to also work with the, the nearby sidewalks. Great. And there's some other considerations that they mix into the pot, but yeah. Great, and uh, I know Mr. misanti has got the transportation um, study task force working on um, related items also so uh, so when we get that whole budget uh, when we get to the the budget conversation about public works budget and paving and uh, chapter 90 and all that business then uh, then we'll we'll have kind of we'll ask them for a more um, detailed recommendation and, and presentation than we typically receive on that so that was a good idea all right anything else mr hayden nope thank you questions for mr hayden all right mr wall <laughs> i'm so excited. i'm sorry is this a question or you're Looking Most to people make on your that side of the room have reports. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walt. <laughs> not too much. Happy New Year. It's yeah. a resolution. <laughs> Just to show there could be historical controversies, even when I'm not in charge of the historical commission, uh, as people have seen from the newspaper, there's no ongoing, uh, whatever, flurry of public interest and discussion uh, regarding the fate of a barn on Lincoln Avenue that was demolished some time ago. And, you know, not only in the south where I just was, but also in Amherst, I guess the past isn't dead. It's not even past. Uh, what happened was that uh, a new property owner uh, acquired this parcel and proposed to demolish a barn, and some residents, uh, the butters and neighbors, <coughs> thought it had historical significance. The historical commission decided that it did not, using the usual rules of the, uh, our zoning bylaw. Uh, Residents wanted to challenge the decision of the demolition. They decided not to hold a demolition delay hearing. The owner went ahead with a demolition, even though he had been informed that some residents might want to appeal some of the process or decision there. And to make a long story short, that, as Ms. O'Keefe knows, because we sat through this very long meeting not long ago, though it seems ages ago, uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals wanted to refer the issue back to the Historical Commission uh, for review. So that'll be coming up in February for coming attractions. Uh, stay tuned. I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it. Never a dull moment. Okay. Thank you. Questions or comments from Mr. Walt? All right. That's a lovely barn. <laughs> a lovely barn. <laughs> My heart pines for them. Okay. Uh, Ms. Brewer. 
I will talk fast. Disability Access Advisory Committee meets tomorrow at Stavros Center at 11.15, and the point I want to make associated with that is one, I don't go to their meetings, and two, um, is that they are working really hard at getting someone from the schools, whether it's from the school committee or an employee of the schools, to attend many of their meetings so that there is that integration between the town side and the school side. So we just keep making progress in that area. So something to look forward to. Um, LSSC Commission, um, based on the recent um, changes, alterations to Community Preservation Act law is wondering if they can say, you know, now that you're talking more about recreation within CPAC, we'd like to make sure that some money really gets set aside for recreation out of CPAC. So I suggested they write a memo, because I said, you know, we really like written memos. Write a memo to CPAC. Explain to them why you want X, Y, or Z, rather than just talking about it at a meeting. So they're working on that, so you may hear more from them. The Housing and Sheltering Committee is going to get their next look at the Housing Production Plan next week, Wednesday the 16th. Wednesday the 16th is a wonderful day. I think I have five <laughs> meetings scheduled that day. I will not be going to all of them, but that will be one of them that I will be going to. And of course, all of these are on the town website. Um, Regional School District Planning Board will also be meeting on the 16th, but more importantly to everyone is you don't this body does not have to go, but the people in the community who are interested, we are going to hear from two consultants on Saturday, February 2nd, from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. That again will be on the website if it isn't already. And note that's an afternoon meeting. We're hoping to get past everybody's, you know, Saturday morning stuff. And that will be held at the middle school. It will be taped by ACTV, available for rebroadcast and streaming. But that's where you will hear directly from two consultants that have been hired to talk about the educational and financial implications of regionalization at the elementary level. There will then be follow-up meetings in each of the communities in February. Amherst is on Wednesday the 13th. So it's best to come hear it directly from the consultants, but if you want to talk more about it after then in order to influence the decision going forward, then February 13th is your time. The Block Grant CDBG Advisory Committee, um, where that stands right now in terms of their activities is they had a meeting since around the time of our last meeting, and they decided that they would have a hearing on Thursday, which is already, of course, on the website. And it is mainly about capital, meaning non-social service, because they don't actually call it capital. But it's non-social service items, because we had some proposals, but we, like, you, like everything else with capital, are, is stuff ready to go? And so they were looking to see if there might be any more new proposals out and to talk about the proposals they already had, because they already did have a hearing in the fall, but this is an additional hearing they were holding. To, have, to get more information. They also informally gave each of the social service agencies who had applied for a certain amount of money back when we thought that would be more money than it's going, than it's likely to end up being, that if they wanted to alter their proposal. So if they wanted to say, oh, let's make this program half as big or let's actually not do this program but a different program, et cetera, wanted to give them that option so that they, with the understanding of our more realistic view of times now and I'm sure we'll hear from the town manager at our next meeting as to what's going to happen with the actual application going forward but the advisory committee is meeting on Thursday at Bank Center that's this week the 10th at 6 30 p.m. Thank you questions or comments from Ms. Brewer all right uh, let's see I think my only liaison report is for safe and healthy neighborhoods working group um it's going well we meet a lot <laughs> we meet tomorrow we meet next uh, tuesday we meet the tuesday after that um the tuesday after that is actually the public uh the public meeting that is the 22nd january 22nd tuesday at 7 p.m uh in this room and that is where whatever we have at that moment and we're going to present to the public tell them how we got here and then what what our status is basically uh at that time um i think the 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 work that that committee is being asked to do is very ambitious very detail oriented um it's a very good group to be doing it and uh i am confident we'll have some sort of recommendations in time for town meeting um all of the information that that group works with is on the website under the living tab of the um on the front page of the website under living if you go down it says safe and healthy neighborhoods you kind of scroll down on that page a little bit and uh and you have all of the packet material it's arranged very similar to how the select board packets are arranged so folks always uh have 
uh, access to exactly the same documents that uh, that the members are working with, and uh, that's going well. So, uh, so I will be keeping you informed about that. Questions or comments about that? Okay. Uh, let's see, Ms. Brewer, open meeting law update? Really, really quickly, um, those of you who didn't see it in the newspaper, uh, there was an editorial associated with it as well as a newspaper article about Southampton Select Board. Basically, the gist of it is, in my opinion, the takeaway is don't go into executive session unless you're really sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> Okay, um, I thought the Gazette was a little generous to them, saying, well, they could have called up somebody else. Well, one assumes they have town council of some kind, who? Um, you don't, they, it's so frustrating as volunteers, you know, to, to try and figure out the right thing to do, but I've seen this happen in other communities as well that hasn't necessarily gotten the press that they have gotten, but it's not a good idea to go into an executive session period is what I'm trying to tell all our all our <laughs> committees and boards out there. Avoid it like the plague. If you're sure you have to have one, talk to town council. At least talk to, I mean, talk to your staff liaison about what you should do next because I have headed off a couple of these myself just going to some committee meetings saying, oh, we could have an executive session to talk about it. That wouldn't be, no, don't do that. <laughs> really bad idea. So <laughs> remember, no executive session. And then the other item was also in the in the beacon how nice is the ethics training that everybody has to do every other year now online that was kind of lame last time around because it wasn't very specific to municipal officials i haven't actually tried to do it which i'm going to test myself on but um, it has been altered allegedly they've just put out the new version of it so and in fact there are two after there's some sort of presentation and then there are basically two tests one is whether or not you're an employee an employee or one is an appointed official of some kind. I'm not even clear on all the details, but it's changed. And so one of the things that happened because of all this ethics information is, of course, it increased the amount of things that our town clerk has to do. You've seen that recently she's been following up and through the select board office to say, you know, we appointed you, but you never got sworn in. And part of the deal is before you get sworn in, you have to take this ethics training. So th there's this constant follow-up that we didn't used to have to do that um, town employees are having to do, but that also some of your various committee members might be hearing about, oh, you haven't done that, and I'll say, oh, it looks different. It's not like it was before, and that's supposed to be for a good reason. So hopefully it will be more useful than it was in the past. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from Ms. Brewer? Okay. Chair's report. Um, I think the only relevant thing I uh, have to mention is just a follow up on the food truck regulations. Um, I told you at the last meeting that I was going to be meeting with folks from the bid and the chamber soon after, and I was hoping to have a recommendation for us or a draft, a draft of something in January. Uh, that meeting got postponed, so obviously I don't have anything for this meeting. Um, whether I have anything for the meeting on the 28th or not remains to be seen. Um, the renewals on the food carts, it turned out that three, we had four licensed food carts last year, only three renewals. Um, the hot dog guy did not renew happy hour hot dogs cart so uh, so we have three renewals those renewals all did receive letters with their licenses I might have mentioned this last time that um, that we're working on new regulations that we expect to uh, implement in late winter or early spring so that remains the, the timeline and as I have more information on that I will give it to you I think that's about everything. Anybody missing anything else from this meeting that needs to be spoken about now? Ms. Brewer. Saturday is the Martin Luther King Jr. breakfast. Um, Saturday mm -hmm. the 19th. The 19th, yep. So the weekend of Martin Luther King at the middle school. And that is that is the one weekend we don't have the farmer's market then. They're in the middle school cafeteria because they're in the same place. So um, the for those... Select board has gotten an email also reminding them of the availability of tickets for that. But just to let the general public know that it's on the 19th, it's on the website, and it will um, mean that the farmer's market isn't taking place that one Saturday. And that starts at 8 o'clock in the morning with coffee, and then food gets served, I think, starting at 8.30 or 9 o'clock, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes until about noontime. Uh, and it's not just the community breakfast. It's also a big scholarship program, and it's really quite, Thank quite you. nice. Um, also happening that weekend is um, on Monday, the 21st, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday day, uh, is on the front steps of Town Hall. Yep. Um, the that woman, Michelle, is her name Brooks, Brooks uh, Michelle Brooks, who 
was recently on the television program singing. Uh, she was uh, some awesome. kind of finalist. Uh, she's going to be singing Happy Birthday on yeah. that day on the front steps, and that's at, did I say what time it is? I can't remember what time it is. Oh, gosh. It's either noon or two. I think it's noon. Um, but anyway, that there will be more information about that on the town website, but folks should be looking forward to that. So, uh, so that should be lovely. Um, okay, so to review, we've got a Saturday <coughs> meeting for all of us who can make it uh, at the middle school this Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Then Wednesday at 4 o'clock, we meet in this room jointly with Finance Committee for the town manager's budget. Then the following Saturday is the Martin Luther King breakfast. Monday is the happy birthday. And then things get more dramatic. The following week, we go to <laughs> MMA, et cetera. <laughs> Mr. Heaton. Then I would move to adjourn. <laughs> All right. And without objection, this meeting adjourns at 8.15. And we will meet here again for a regular meeting on the 28th of January. Thank you very much. <laughs>